always very hard to say. Um, and their message was, think of the children when they pass the bucket around. So I will share that with you all here. <laughs> Yeah, That's I know. <laughs> it has a, I was like, that has a very different connotation in, in a different, different room. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody. I said, um, as I told my second panel, that on my first panel, I said good morning at 1 p.m. And it took me halfway through the panel to realize it was afternoon. So I will be in, in fact, the, the right time of day, both mentally and physically, during this panel. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the Vice President for U.S. Policy at the Future Privacy Forum, which is a global community of experts and practitioners thinking through issues around privacy, data governance, and data management um, within many, many different sectors. I have two experts over here on um, many different facets of internet law and policy and um, as relevant to this topic, social media. So I will go ahead and let them introduce themselves to you. Hi, my name is Dwayne Gatesell. I'm an intellectual property lawyer in Austin, Texas, which means I do a lot of copyright, trademark, personality rights, licensing, that sort of thing. And hi, I'm Haley Tsukayama. I'm Associate Director of Legislative Activism at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, I focus mostly on state level policy and I also do a lot of our consumer privacy work. So I always like to start a panel by level, level setting with who do we have here? We're going to have maybe a little bit more of a conversation. We don't, none of us, I think, like to spend the whole time just talking at a bunch of people. Um, you all have different experiences and backgrounds. So I'm going to start with how long have folks been on social media? And I want to, I want to show up hands if you've been on social media for at least zero to five years. Six to 10 years. 11 to 15, 16 to 20, more than 25 years. What social media platform have you been on for more than 25? What was your first social media platform? There you go. Um, for, for some of our 16 to 20, what was your first social media platform? MySpace. 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 I was gonna say, are there any live journalers here? <laughs> I, Friendster? Okay. Usenet. Yeah. So there is a lot of um, pooled social media experience in this room. Um, how many of you have active social media accounts today? And, and as might be relevant to the panel description, um, how many of you specifically ha had, as of at least two years ago, active Twitter accounts? How many of you still have active, the artist formerly known as Twitter accounts? <laughs> 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 About half of you. Um, so that gives us a good basis. Um, I'm going to turn to Haley and Dwayne in a second and ask them what their top two or three um, points are to bring up with where social media is today and is the honeymoon over? Um, when was the wedding? I would like you <laughs> I both know. to address. Um, <laughs> and how long was this honeymoon and has it been over for a while? Um, after that, I will have a few questions for them. But at that point or at any point during this panel, really, if you have something that you are just burning to ask, feel free to line up at the microphone. We'll take as many questions as we can throughout the discussion. Um, but a question should be approximately no longer than two minutes, and at the end of it, your voice should go up as if there were a question mark there um, <laughs> that the, the panelists can address. So um, over to um, Haley, why don't we start with you just because you introduced yourself second. Um, <laughs> what are the things that you would want to raise um, in regard to some sort of honeymoon for social? Where did we go on our honeymoon? Was it somewhere well, nice? I think uh, I think we went to IPOs. I mean, so <laughs> before I, before I was at EFF, I was a consumer tech reporter for the Washington Post, and I started in 2010, which was a pretty exciting time actually to cover all of this stuff. And um, you know, it's to, to me, it's just been really interesting to see the life cycle of all of these companies. I mean, I covered many of them um, when they were kind of startupy, right? Um, when people were like, "Twitter's just what you had for breakfast." There was a lot of dismissal of it, and then. Um, then we saw some things happen. They were like, oh, when you let people talk to each other, uh, these products actually become quite 
popular, quite useful. Um, so things like Arab Spring um, comes up a lot, right, when we're talking about sort of what were, what were the moments when these companies really um, came on, you know. Can you say a little bit about the Arab Spring for folks who might not be as familiar? Yeah, sure. So the Arab Spring, um, well, you might know more context about it, but in very broad strokes, um, the Arab Spring was sort of the first, from a Twitter perspective, it was the first time that we really saw Twitter be used for um, global organizing of, of large-scale protests, um, particularly, um, actually, which countries was it? Yeah. Um, Tunisia was a big one. Yeah. Egypt. Egypt. Egypt, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that was really a, a, a big moment when, um, you know, particularly at the Washington Post, suddenly they were like, oh, Haley, you have to write stories that, that, uh, that are going to be on the, in the paper paper as opposed to on the blocks. Um, and so uh, I think that was sort of a moment when people realized that there was a lot, um, a lot there. Um, and then, of course, uh, as they got more successful, I covered when, they're, uh, when they went public and when there was all this frenzy around, um, around the stock, you know, the stock prices and what are they going to do and how are they going to become real big boy companies. Um, I think a lot of the time um, in media, particularly at that time, there was a lot of coverage of founders in a very fawning sort of way. Um, and so in that way, I do think that that was a bit of a honeymoon, right? Um, certainly some rose-colored glasses um, about these, you know, this new generation of guys, let's be honest, um, who were going to change the world um, in the same way that we had seen um, the founders of consumer electronics products change the world. Um, and so to me, that's really when that honeymoon was. Um, and certainly because I was in DC and covering things tech from a policy perspective as well, I think there was a lot of leeway given to um, you know, coming out of the recession that we'd been in. These are the companies that are driving the, Ameri the new American economy. Um, let them self-regulate, don't step in. You know, we don't understand what's going on. We don't want to mess up a good thing. Um, and of course, that is no longer the case, but I'll let Dwayne take it. So personal story, and this is a little off topic, but years ago I bought a used Tesla, and my youngest daughter thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Then Elon Musk personality comes out and the whole Twitter thing and all, and now it's a terrible embarrassment to her. And it's, oh, Dad, how can you drive that? You know, how can you drive that car? That, I think, you take that attitude and transplant it over to social media, kind of indicates what a lot of consumers are going through of, gee, this, this tool could be used for good. And instead, it tends to get twisted and turn to evil. And there have been so many studies that tend, we had a panel on this yesterday, the three of us, about kind of the, the social ills of the harm that occurs to children with respect to social media and so forth. And so, personally, I think that that's a lot of what's going on as people understand more and more about the actual detriment that social media can cause. But the question of whether the honeymoon is over, I, I actually did a Google search for, you know, is the honeymoon over for social media? The earliest article I found about that was 2002. So, <laughs> so this discussion of, oh, it's over, maybe it's just a talking point, maybe it's an actual feeling by the and writer. And can I specify, 2002 was 21 years ago of which there was one of you who raised their hand that they were on social media at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, so this discussion has been going on. Okay, I get it. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and the author maybe had a, an ax to, to grind. I don't know. But any time you take something that you like and it changes, someone is going to be the 80-year-old man in the room, you know, you kids, get off of my yard. <laughs> so you feel that way if your favorite platform changes. For me personally, the honeymoon kind of changed. It, a friend of mine put it to me this way, that it's like that Christmas gift that you get when you're a kid and you're so excited to play with it, and then after a while, it, it, you put it aside and you never play with it again. That was me with social media. Um, yes, I still have accounts, but they're not really that active. I don't really do that much because for me, it's like, oh, okay, whatever. So there are a lot of issues, I think, that come up when you talk about social media in this conversation. I think one of the reasons it's going to be so hard is that it can be so broad ranging and everybody has a different ax to grind potentially when it comes to social media. Um, so I wrote down a few. If this is one of your hills that you would be willing to die on, I just want a show of hands. Um, and then I want, what, what am I missing? So intellectual property. 
Content moderation? Privacy? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Job security. Uh, harassment? What else? Kids. Controlling how bots work. Bots. Monetization of people's content. I would put that in IP, but I think it's I like a subset. Monetization. As someone who uses social media a lot to promote their business, like I would love to know like what do you think is next? I know that's kind of more of like a marketing question, mm -hmm. but like what do you think the new wave is? Where, what's the new wedding that you want to get yeah, the invitation to? I would love an invitation to. I'm just, just generally curious. Uh, yeah. uh, pink and then right in front of you. The impact of uh, how politicians and public figures using social media then impacts broader political. Mm -hmm. okay. Politicians and let's say policymakers more generally using social media and that impact. Yes. What is it, how they So data collection, that's a little yeah, bit broader than privacy, I would say. Um, black shirt and then black hat. <laughs> also, also under that privacy rubric, anonymity. Anonymity, that's a, a big one from yesterday, actually. Addiction. Addiction. Um, folks, I'm gonna run out of lines on my sheet of paper. <laughs> this may be somewhat covered, but it's almost a cross purposes, this thing with 20 other panels are talking about using social media like TikTok and whatever, blogging to promote your brand. And this sounds like a little more like the parking brake, the cautionary tale. So it seems maybe address the bit that, as I say, there, there should be somewhat cross messaging here. So if you guys are more of the cautionary note, but there's a lot, there are many, many other panels here that seem to be say, thinking of it as an unalloyed good actually mm -hmm. to promote your, your offering <coughs> brand or whatever. So influencers and brands. Yeah, brands. Yeah. I actually kind of had a question um, that feels a little bit yeah. Is this? Oh, that's very loud. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Um, now you know how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> when y'all say social media, like, how broad are you thinking? Because something like Twitter is pretty different from something like Reddit, which is pretty different from, like, a forum or IRC, I guess, to go way back. Um, I guess, like, what's your frame for this discussion? sort of the, the question there. So I, I'm going to take these, I have what's next and what is social media. I'm going to write these down and I'm going to open them to both of you okay. in sequence. Um, but there were two more hands up that I had for, three more hands up that I had for separate issues before. Um, I mean, no one seems to ever talk about just responsibility in your own self, accountability of how you absorb this stuff. Mm -hmm. Accountability. Because even people I know, and we kind of have these, these sort of debates and conversations, they, they talk about things that they've heard on some platform or somewhere without a vetting of the information, without a, an understanding. <laughs> oh, that should have been a misinformation? Can I put that well, as a separate but, one? Yeah, but those yeah, words have sort of lost their meaning because misinformation, your misinformation is not my misinformation, vice versa. I think people have, lo have forgotten a sense of responsibility. You can go find all kinds of stuff out on the internet, mm -hmm. but don't just parrot what you found and, and actually speak, speak from authority, because I heard it on Twitter. So I have accountability, and yeah, I, I, I took my liberty of adding misinformation. Yeah, um, and, and it, it, it falls under that. Where, yeah. But again, what, what is misinformation, disinformation anymore? So um, gentlemen in the, I think, greenish lanyard, and then in the back in the white shirt, and then up here in the green shirt, and then we're, I am out of lines. So just those three. <laughs> well, he said disinformation was my thing, or more deliberate political disinformation. Dis and misinformation. I'm going to add malinformation, if that's a term that you haven't heard of before. I am not. PSYOPs. <laughs> Russia, China. The enclosure, the Soviet enclosure. Closure of public community spaces. I think that's a, probably a reason for end it, the honeymoon being over. Of closure of public communities. One of the reasons I'm parroting you all is so it goes into the microphone and thus into the recording. Um, and then down here we had one it's more. Kind of tying back to what this gentleman said is confirmation bias. 
confirmation, confirmation bias. bias. Mm-hmm. All right. I do want to just, I mean, so you all have brought up a lot of interesting issues. We talked a little bit about, like, when was the honeymoon? I think for a lot of people it is important to know that these have always been problems on social media, and it sort of just hit a critical mass or a point in the discussion. So, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So you have um, all of these issues to cover in the next 43 minutes. (laughs) No problem. Good luck. So we're going to start with the two questions that we got, and then I'm going to open it up a little more to just how... Kind of, Haley, for you to elaborate on what you just said, are these new, where have the issues come from and where are they going? Um, so the first one is, what is social media? And I think that we started with how long have you been on it? We got in a variety of different types of social media people have been on. So how would you define it? Me? Yeah. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> Dealer's choice. <laughs> one thing, I think it's important, we mentioned this yesterday, early on, this was called social networking and had a very different implication than social media. And we talked about the different reasons and why politicians want to push it into the social media area for regulation. But for me personally, the idea of social networking is a good thing. It's connecting with people. It's you know having a safe space. It's having a community. It's finding your tribe, all that kind of thing, which I think is a very positive thing. When you go into social media, however, That gives my crazy uncle with the bullhorn the ability to broadcast to the entire world, you know, his crazy conspiracy theories about this and that. And, you know, from my perspective, that's bad. Okay, sure, everybody's entitled to their opinion. But then you do get into that that misinformation and malinformation and so forth. And it amplifies the negativity. And we all know that the algorithm of this, negativity drives engagement. That's what it's built for. And so if you have that amplified, you're going to continue to spread this this toxic disease through our society, sorry, in my opinion. Um, And so for me, that's kind of where the the honeymoon ended, is this conversion from something that has a more overwhelming positive benefit to something that seems to have much more negativity than anything else. So for me, to answer the question in a very long way, my apologies, what is social media? It is kind of any social forum that now allows for the amplification amplification of a single person's voice. That's what it is for me. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I I definitely like I agree with that. I think um, when I I mean social media. <laughs> because we work in legislation, definitions matter, and it's like a very hard thing to define. Um, I really think about it as, like as a, as a human, I think about it as sort of like where, com- where are communities built? Where do we talk to each other? Where do we have conversations? I think, um, you know, if you look in, in the legislative definitions, it's like a platform that in, you know, allows social interaction of so many users and has these, um, you know, these kinds of elements to them. So I think it's actually a very difficult thing to define. Um, I do think of it fairly broadly because I think once you, if you just said, okay, it's just, um, you know, places where you post your own content and people react, then you're like, well, but that doesn't really cover, you know, a lot of other places. And if you're thinking about like, who should um, who should be who should have certain responsibilities to their users? Then you go well. You want to make that really broad. If you're thinking about um, you know censorship or something like that, then you want to be really narrow. So I think it's actually incredibly difficult to define, which is mm-hmm. kind of my way of not answering. But yeah. um, it's sort of everything, right? <laughs> um, on, online. Um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. That that was the whole question. Oh, there was a whole question. Okay. So we have a, another question of what's next, but I'm going to put a pin in that with with yeah. vi- verbal permission from the person who asked it, um, or visual permission. Sorry, from the person who asked it. If, um, if I if, if I can yeah. add something to what Haley just said. Absolutely. The author Simon Kemp wrote this really interesting article. It was in Data Reportal, and he talks about exactly that. What is classified as social media? And there's all kind of, like you said, I mean, there's all kinds of things that technically don't fall within certainly my definition of social media, but it might be things from Messenger to WhatsApp to YouTube to on and on and on. And it was really interesting because we talk about, you know, is the honeymoon over and so forth, and yet his his data indicates that's really more of a media construct than it is 
actuality and reality. Because, for example, Facebook is the most, has the most active monthly users at 2.96 billion, about 37% of the population. Uh, YouTube has about 2.5 billion monthly logged in users through their mobile platform. TikTok has the highest average monthly use, uh, consisting of about 23 and a half hours per user per month. Um, web traffic usually isn't factored into this, and some of the, the platform's websites are more popular than the mobile app. And so he makes a very convincing case through data that this talk of the honeymoon being over, yes, based on all the hands that were raised, we all have our access to grind, and yet it continues to march on and the numbers continue to grow. Not across all platforms, but generally speaking. And the global average is that people are on uh, 7.2 platforms per person. So. <laughs> um, we will get back to this. I'm yeah. like counting, uh-oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm way behind. <laughs> so putting what's next aside just very temporarily, given the, the long list of issues that have been raised. I'm interested if you can speak to maybe where policies had to be developed that took social media maybe from iteration number one or like not necessarily beta mode, but like its first version of itself mm -hmm. into maybe being a more formalized um, formal wedding invitation thing. <laughs> I love um, this I'm going to stick with this analogy, by the way, <laughs> there, folks. I did not write the analogy, but you're all stuck with it. <laughs> um, where, what took it into the formal world? Where were policies needed to get to that point? And then as a, as a part B, what policies maybe fell away or were de-incentivized that you think maybe created some more tension or issues around social media? Yeah. So I think... It's, I mean, it's a huge question, so I'm going to try and just, like, uh, corral my con day three brain into, <laughs> into answering. But um, to me, I think, if I think back to what we were reporting, right, if I think back to, like, what stories came up first, it certainly was, I think, harassment was initially, for me, a huge thing that came up, both personally and then also as a, as a, as a reporter looking at the stories. Um, and, you know, you, f you found those often in marginalized communities, right? So marginalized communities who really wanted to use social media because for the first time you could connect to people all over the world who, you know, who were not, who were like you and were not like the people who may have been around you, um, or activists or people who were, you know, concerned about speaking out in other ways. Um, and uh, harassment there. So I think, um, you know, seeing the social media companies really grapple with really a use case that I think they had not thought about uh, it when in the development of the product, right? Which I understand, like you're thinking like, okay, I just want to like send 140 characters, 160 at that, 140 at that time, um, characters um, to my friends and, you know, just kind of post about what I'm doing. Um, you're not thinking about, okay, how, this, how is this going to be used for political speech? How is this going to be used for organizing? How is this going to be used for creating an online d identity that I'm trying to hide part of from my family, for example? Um, and so I think harassment is, is a big one that came up. Content moderation um, in many ways, right? It's like uh, what opinions are okay and what opinions are not on your own platform on each platform kind of figuring out like what level of moderation on each platform fits what you want to say um trying to figure out like you know what do you do about hate speech online how do you um you know you could say well it's it's all free speech like people have opinions but then sometimes those opinions uh, turn into actions and they actively hurt other people and so i think Early on, that is a lot of what we saw being grappled with, and I think with larger and larger communities, or certainly more and more communities over time. Um, so that I think is is one answer of, of just sort of like what were the first things that that they didn't think about. It, you know, privacy is kind of the issue of my heart, and I think in in the way that we're, um, if you're talking about um, ways that we didn't engage with with social media in the beginning that's led to where we are right now. I think certainly thinking about data collection, data use, secondary uses of data, all of that, we never really grappled with on a legislative level early. And um, it really let us double down into a system that I find quite harmful. And I think if we're thinking about algorithms and serving recommendations and all that kind of stuff, that's all based on 
a, you know, data collection and use um, and the way that you do it. Um, and I really would have liked to see, uh, you know, when I started at the Post in 2010, it was definitely the year that they were going to pass consumer privacy legislation. <laughs> um, and yeah, by I the remember those days. <laughs> Um, and by the time I left, of course, we were even further than we were um, when I started. So. How many in this room think the U.S. has a blanket federal U.S. privacy law? Okay. Oh, we've done our education work. We do. <laughs> but it only applies to the federal government. It's yeah. called... <laughs> it's not like the European law, right? No, we don't no, have like not. a general data protection regulation. But many states do. California does. Utah, a growing number of states, um, have privacy laws. Um, we have actually a quilt in our office where we get to put a push pin into every state as they pass a law. Um, and it becomes a bit of a ceremony. Um, but <coughs> federal government does not. We were almost there in 2010. We were almost arguably there last year, maybe, depending on who you ask. Um, but we're not there. It's interesting, though, because on that issue the privacy I mean not the privacy the private sector because it's just easier if, if someone has one particular rule like most companies have adopted the European standards for privacy simply because if you're a multinational you can't have this patchwork quilt and so your larger companies will think okay fine we're, we're in Austin or wherever we're adopting the EU directive on on privacy um, you keep going I'm going to no. cue the, I'm going to cue um, a question up <laughs> One thing I wanted to add on to, to what Haley said, for me, I think that the change probably, again, from this social networking idea to social media is, oh, we can make money from that? Yep. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. We're going to change and we're going to do all of this sort of thing. And then once they wholesale went headlong into this, then that's when we're, the law in particular is trying to play catch up. Not a week goes by that I don't have to do a takedown request. To Facebook or to Instagram or whomever because someone is using a client's trademark or copyrighted material or whatever and so all of that just like you said it's not something that they thought about at the beginning it was okay we're making all this money oh we got problems now oh how do we address this oh we better do a takedown thing and some platforms are better than others on responding to that but literally not a week goes by that I'm not my client has you know rights in this and so forth and it's used at this particular spot and you need to take it down and most of them are pretty good about okay delete it do you want to introduce a question to this conversation or get the follow-on question you just asked what what is the problem stopping a federal law is it lobbying or is it just the republicans and democrats can't agree to a concept or what is stopping it that the states are picking it up a federal privacy law yes Oh, um, <laughs> let me boil my entire job down into like two minutes. Um, I mean, well, and Amy too can answer this, but I mean, there are, there are a lot of things. I mean, I think at some point, um, you know, I'm not like a fatalist, but I, I have a, I've lost a lot of, of my faith in the ability of this Congress to do very much because of just the breakdown and the, and the division, right? right. Um, I, I like to think of privacy as a bipartisan issue, and certainly as we've seen in, you know, as states pick it up, it, it's been picked up by both Democrats and Republicans, even in a, in a fairly divided state climate. Um, but there are a lot of different, you know, people generally, if you poll them, say that they're in support of privacy legislation, but there are a lot of different ways to write privacy legislation. Um, and certainly what we're seeing at the state level right now is that there are some, um, there are some provisions that, I'm a consumer advocate, so I'm going to, they're more business friendly, right? Um, and that I don't like as much um, because they allow for more, more unconsented collection, more unconsented use. Um, and then there are some that are, are stronger that are more on the consumer advocate side. And um, certainly at the state level, I think it's, it's a lobbying battle, right? Um, we, uh, our state program is, is me and a half, like, you know, um, and I'm going up against Amazon. Google, Microsoft, um, and so there's certainly a, a lobbying battle that's happening. And then there's also just, I think, a, um, a philosophical debate yeah. in a lot of cases about, um, you know, should it be opt-in collection? Should it be opt-out collection? Should it be, uh, how do you enforce it? Does it go through the state attorney general? Does it, um, is it an individual right to sue? So there are a lot of flavors, and I think um, there are a lot of debates over all those flavors, and then state by state, you know, depending on your industry, um, Connecticut has a privacy law. It's very favorable to insurance companies, right? Because um, there are a lot of insurance companies there. Um, 
you know, you see this happen in a lot of ways. So I think yeah. it's a, to me, it's a combination. The federal question is, um, to me, and Amy can, can augment this answer, but um, it's just hard to get people to agree on very much um, right now. And, you know, states are picking stuff up, but they're kind of picking it up in their own way. Um, I actually think this is a, I, I'm trying to gauge to the extent I'm about to annoy Haley. That's fine. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> which is going to be at some extent, and we'll see. Um, I think a lot of tech policy, and this applies not only to privacy, this actually applies across the board to almost every issue that got brought up, which is why I want to talk about it. The people working on those issues are in their own way to some extent. Um, how many people in here know of any law that they think of is perfect? It, it doesn't necessarily exist. But there are, like, how many people have a law that they think is generally a net good and they're happy that it's out there? Any law. <laughs> so there are things on, the, there are worries with these issues that you need to, you're going to get one bite at the apple. It needs to be great. You need to have the right misinformation law. You need to have the right privacy law. And when you have people arguing on both sides that it's either too strong or too weak or too many civil rights protections or not enough civil rights protections or not enough control or too much control, um, there will always be a reason to say no to a law. Saying no to something is very easy. You can always find a reason. Um, and it's very hard to say yes to something. And we're at a point with a lot of laws and technology where um, it is louder it is more um, acceptable to people who are constituents of members of Congress to stand up and say, I am saying no to this because, because it resonates, as opposed to I'm saying yes to this in spite of, which feels dirty um, to a lot of constituents. So I think that actually, in, to some extent, as a privacy advocate and as somebody who's worked on human rights issues for a lot of different things, we are in our own way of making progress um, and that is just a, a reality we're all going to have to grapple with at some point, and likely this year on AI, because I think AI is the topic du jour um, for the federal Congress this year and likely next year, where we're going to have to figure out where we're going to land. You're not annoying me, by the way. Yes! <laughs> One thing Our I, organizations have different priorities, but I, I, yeah, I agree with you. One thing I wanted to add on to that is that even more fundamentally, and I made this argument yesterday, is that our entire system is built on conflict. We have two conflicting goals. We talk about freedom and equality. Well, the more free you are, the less equal you are. The more equal you are, the less free you are. And so if I put aside my cynicism about politicians in general, and it gets to this philosophical issue, and it also gets to the gentleman's responsibility question, you can have a genuine argument about whether you know, regulation is a good thing or a bad thing if you're coming at it from this kind of philosophical difference that's baked into our entire society. So when I'm not being cynical about politicians, which is about 98% of the time, and I step back and I say, okay, you can have an honest debate as to whether you know, social media is a good thing, whether more regulation, less regulation is a good thing, whether it ought to be left up to the parents. For example, I have two girls, and when they were young, they were allowed 30 minutes of screen time per day, and that was it. And they could choose. It could be a computer game. It could be a TV, whatever. And I'm not saying that's the right solution or anything else, but if parents exercise control over what their kids can watch and so forth, and they teach them, and it's all about education and how you do this, then some of the dangers of social media dissipate. Um, again, that's not right for everyone, but I think you do have to look at it in terms of some of the larger structural issues and some of the parental issues that we all have to take some responsibility for. So, so we've, we've talked a little bit about the, the wedding and the relationship. The, like, the things that come up when you are in a relationship with somebody and that you have to work through, some of them get better, some of them get worse, there's a lot of issues, and you power through. Um, I'm going to start getting us into the harder part of the conversation, which is when the relationship turns really bad. Um, you're not quite necessarily to the breakup point yet, but what happens when things start really going off the rails and you're losing communities? And then we'll talk about what's next and, and how you get into the next relationship. Um, so before I do that, why don't we introduce another question and then we'll, we'll move to that piece. Yeah, just, just curious as to, to your opinion as far as the difficulty in regulating 
uh, or implementing an effective law, is the argument more one on the principle, what do you regulate and how, or is the scope, who are you regulating, what is social media, getting back to the, some of the definitional issues, are ISPs included in that privacy legislation, uh, for example. So I was just wondering your thoughts on that. I would say all of the above. I would also say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> if there's something to fight about, people will be fighting we'll about it. it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I have a question. So we're, we've talked about, you know, regulating the crazy uncle and, um, you know, the maybe flat earth. I belong to the flat earth society. I do not believe it's flat. <laughs> um, it's entertaining, but it also makes me think, you know, why do I believe the earth is round? It has it. Anyway, so I like that these are allowed to exist. Um, the th concern I have is how it's getting promoted. Um, so I want to know if there's, you know, instead of regulating the crazy uncle in the flat earth society, why are we regulating these people? I mean, we've had UFOs when in the 40s, 50s, before I was born, um, ghosts, Loch Ness Monster, all these things. So it's nothing new. Why don't we regulate, can we regulate, is there a way to write legislation so that we can regulate the companies that are promoting certain things, demoting other things. Ba basically, I want to know how their algorithm works. Not, and maybe not the technical details because I could see how they would want to keep that private, but I generally want to know like the transparency. You know, if I'm constantly responding to this negativity on the flat earth, you know, group, how it, that's going to promote it. Well, I would like to know that so that I don't respond in that way. I respond in a different way. Like mm -hmm. I make an angry face and it demotes it, right? right. So I just think that that's, if maybe we could put it in the about section I, and we could force companies to basically be more transparent. Is there a way to legislate in, in that realm? So we're regu regu legislating the corporations instead of the users. It's a great question because uh, you know, I'm all in favor of First Amendment rights. You know, I think there's a difference between if you want to believe in the flying spaghetti monster, more power to you. You know, um, when it crosses over into something that is hate speech, that is racially motivated, that kind of thing, that's where I think, legally speaking, you can step in. I mean, the Supreme Court decided long ago that you don't have the right, for example, to falsely yell fire in a crowded movie house. Well, to me, that's kind of the equivalent. If you're talking about flat earth or you know whatever else, okay, great, more power to you. When you are targeting you know, minorities or people at, at risk and so forth, that's when you get into an actual societal harm, and that's where I think you, legally speaking, can regulate that part of it. And that's regulating the user, not the corporation. Personally, I think it's a great idea if if all of these companies had to post something in their abouts section of this is how our algorithm works. And the way it works is they collect all that data. And if you do the clickbait thing and you respond and you're going to those sites, they know about it and they're gonna target and you're gonna all of a sudden, you know, you, you click on one site and later on you start seeing the ads for something that's specifically for you. It's because they're vacuuming up all that data and using it to target you. And I did a speech years ago about uh, Brexit. This is, this is how Brexit happened. All the social media usage, all that data, targeted the people who were kind of waffling, and they used the information specifically. And immigration and taking jobs was a big, big issue. And so they targeted people in areas because they could drill down to neighborhoods and say, oh, Joe Smith, who lives in this area, is worried about immigrants taking the job, his job. So they pushed ads to Joe Smith, so to get him to say, yeah, Brexit, that's what we need. It is astounding, it is horrifying how this was driven by social media targeting people who had you know, given up their data for free, basically, responding to various things so that they know this is how we can use it, in my opinion, for a bad thing. So don't, don't click on those ads. So, so my specific question for that then, that's a good example, is how do we you know, legislate that, that, no, it's the user's data, right? Because it, the user owns it. So how can we legislate that this data is being used in this way? And they have to disclose that information. So I want to basically f legislate them to force them to disclose the information. So I want to yeah. get to the how to legislate question. Do you mind okay. if I uh, put that in the? Yeah. 
I, I have it written down. Um, but I want, I want to start actually with a little bit of a story. And I don't know if either of you podcast, I don't know how many of you listen to podcasts, but there used to be a podcast by the name of Reply All. Um, and one of their very last episodes was called Flying the Coop. Mm. And it was about a community on Facebook of people who own chickens. And they would talk about chicken diseases. They would share photos of their chickens. It was a very large, very loving community of people who own chickens. I don't know. Does anybody here own chickens? Yeah, I'm talking to one person. I don't own chickens either. But I, I, I love the fact that there's a chicken community. And it turned out that the owner of said chicken community was a fairly youngish kid. He was a teenager. And he decided that he was selling his chickens. He didn't want to own chickens anymore. He wanted to get into cryptocurrency. So he took the chicken community and he messaged all the hundreds of thousands of chicken community people and said, this is no longer a chicken community. This is a cryptocurrency community. Please see your way out if you don't want to deal with cryptocurrency. But that's what we're going to be talking about now. And then he started messaging all of them about cryptocurrency going forward. And the chicken community people were angry. They had had this for years and years, this place to talk about chickens. And now they couldn't use it to talk about chickens. Their content was no longer welcome in their own community. They had to find another place to be. Um, and I found this story to be fascinating, mostly because I listened to it um, actually way before Elon Musk was even talking about buying Twitter, um, where people got displaced from a social media platform in a much larger number. But I want to ask you two, what are the things that people have available to them? when they feel, if anything, when they feel like they have lost their place, their community, their home on the internet. Mm. And opening up the box that I just put over here in the corner, is there a legislative place to put rules in place to make sure that people have some sort of power over what happens in their online homes? Just a very small question. I know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I think... So EFF covers an, a large number of issues, and because I do state legislation, I get, you know, an inch deep in all of them. And it's funny because you pull on one, right? We're pulling on privacy, or we're pulling on on speech too, right? And then, oh, the competition bar over here is waving because I think it's increasingly more difficult to find new homes, right? Because of the way that these um, that the that the companies have consolidated and the way that they've become very dominant, and so. You know, we talk a lot at EFF about um, what we call competitive compatibility, right? So we'd like to see standards around, like, data portability, right? Because certainly I'm having this right now where I've had a Twitter account since I was in journalism school. Um, I've built up a following there. Now all of my people are scattered to the winds, right? I have a Blue Sky account. I have a Mastodon account. I'm not really using either of them, but, like, half my people are here, half my people are there. And it would be really great to say hey, like with their consent, when they maybe jumped, um, if they could say, yeah, if anybody's looking for me, tell them I'm here, right? Or say that, um, you know, they can download, if they're on my contact list, then they can download it. And when they move over to the new platform, then they can, they can set up the community there. I think that's, a, that's, in terms of legislation, that's a thing that we would like to see. Um, in terms of what people can do right now, I think that's a really, really hard question. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure legally how you know, what the recourse or anything would be. I mean, obviously, yes, you can set up your own your own site, but then you lose all of the you know, other users unless you provide your contact information, like Haley said. That's a tough one. So the last piece I wanted to get to from, like, what can people do now is the what's next question. But I had two very confused faces in the audience from my last question. So I want to invite you both up to the mic real quick, and I will get I, – I see you who's standing there who I'm – I just want to – I say that I saw you and invite you to, to uh, respond. I mean, it, I, don't, I don't understand what kept any of the hundreds of whoever thousands were on this podcast or listening to it from just started going on and starting their own chicken podcast for everybody else. What Was there a law that stopped them? Was there, I mean, what, so okay, this guy stopped talking about chickens. What keeps you from starting your own thing and getting everyone to move to that and start talking about chickens? I, I don't understand yeah. how it's like you have to legislate that this dude stops talking about what you want to talk about. Well, you're free to go set your own thing up and invite these hundreds of thousands of people over. That, that's where I get, 
sure. kinky about the government getting into people's business. Sure. My thought is, I, you know, stay out of my business until I'm doing something detrimental to somebody. The fact that I don't want to talk about chickens anymore isn't hurting you. Go, go start your own chicken, you know, yeah. podcast. Yeah. Yeah, legally speaking, again, the only thing that would be stopping someone from doing the same thing is if they were using the same name. You know, if the, I, and I don't know, if the one chicken podcast thing had a trademark, so you couldn't use the same name for your oh, own. Sure, yeah, that, um, I mean, that's legal. That's legal. Yeah, so I'm saying yeah. Forever, yeah. that would be one thing that would prevent you from using it. And the other thing is simply, yeah, sure, you can set up your own site to talk about the same content, but you're probably going to lose the database of all of those people who subscribe to it. Yeah. So you would have, it would be a longer rebuilding process and so forth. But can you? Yes. And I think, sorry, I was thinking of it more as a parable, right? Um, to me, it, the thing that resonated about that story is I signed up for a thing and then they turned it into a different thing without my consent, right? And so to me, that is troubling, right? And I think we are seeing that happen with online communities where they're kind of, the rules are changing under you and um, that is very upsetting, right? Especially if they're going to use it for something else than what you agreed to. I think you're right that you can set up different things, um, but there's always a resource question, right? So if you're talking about like an online community and you just make a different online community on the same forum, everybody has an account, you know, maybe that's an easy thing. If it's um, the social network that I have used for 10 years is changing under my feet and um, it's not easy to go start a new thing, right? So I think I was kind of thinking as a, as a parable more than in the specific case. So question, yes. Yeah, so um, this kind of goes, dovetails with this a bit, I think. So when we think of social media as it's, it's community, it's like the space where people interact, where we talk. If we looked to like a non, if we tried to find a, an analog that wasn't digital, it'd be like a public square or a cafe or anywhere that you can go and you can talk to people. And there are places that exist that are public and the rules that apply there, whatever rules are put in place by the law and if it's private property, whatever, you know, uh, policies that private property owner has. On the internet, there is only private platforms. There is no public forum. And yet we've seen things like Twitter become public forums. These, is, these are places where people are, it's acting as a public forum. People from all around the world are talking about issues Policymakers and politicians are using these public forums to spread their message and advocate for their points. And this whole time, these spaces are privately owned, and the way that, like, the whole point of the platform is to make the owner money because it's a business. So, these, in my opinion, these two, the public forum and it being privately owned, are kind of at, at odds motivation. So my question then is, there's the aspect of we need to regulate these things to a degree, but is there also room to be asking like should, and, and competition being so hard because of the monopolizing power of these companies, should we start thinking about should there be a public alternative and what would that look like? I don't know if it's something I want, but I'm just floating it. So because we're at 11 minutes, I want to take both questions together and give you both a chance to answer them together, if that's. Um, my question concerns, so prior to government regulation, either state or uh, country or uh, uh, local, uh, what we've relied on on the internet has been contract law. Uh, back and forth, what we have is usually printed on the terms of service, and we've had issues where we see breaches of that terms of service and lack of recourse. Mm -hmm. And now sometimes that goes into a class action lawsuit, but now since we are seeing different legislation from different uh, states even mm -hmm. within a, uh, a country, how do we keep up what, uh, with what our rights are and how we can find recourse when what we previously relied on was turban service and contract law is now changing depending on whatever state that this company might be in compared to where I might be in. So a question on do we need a public option mm -hmm. and a question on how, how do people know what their rights are and figure out how to exercise them? 
let you take looking that one. Looking at me. Um, <laughs> I mean, sorry, it's like, oh, man. I, mean, I think a public option is, is a really interesting idea. I get very nervous, however, thinking about, okay, who then, who regulates, who moderates, who does that, right? Uh, you know, I, I am a, a, a legislative person. I care a lot about what government does and can't do, but I also don't necessarily want them to be the moderators of speech. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I mean, ever. Um, and so uh, that, it's an interesting question. And it's true that, you know, it can be frustrating that all of these are private options. And especially as I talked about dominance of platforms, like what are the, what are the other options? But Oh, Billy. I mean, I'd have to really, really think for a long time about what a good alternative is because a public option just at a visceral level makes me very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I think if you have trouble controlling the private option, imagine <laughs> what total unlimited free-for-all a public option could be. Because yeah. at least, as the, the second questioner asked, you do have issues of contract law, you have issues of copyright issues and so forth that you can utilize to tamp down on some of the excesses. But if it's a public forum, unregulated, uh, hmm, Nazi aliens landing in Florida, and what do you do? And, mm. Why does it always have to be Florida, folks? You <laughs> <laughs> mean yeah. I've both lived in I mean, Florida. I, I mean, I, being from Texas, I have no room to speak. I, just, I like to say I'm from Austin because we're a little less crazy than the rest of the state. But, um, yeah, I'm from Minnesota. I, I you. you can throw it under the bus if you want right now. No, no, no <laughs> we, we've got the crazy Minnesota. We're, mm. <laughs> oh, every state has them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and in terms of, of rights, I mean, it is, it, it's a shifting landscape. So it's, it's also a very difficult um, question. You know, in California, we've passed quite a few laws. Um, and you should have, a, there should be a little link that tells you what your CCPA rights are at the bottom of every compliant website. Um, those are difficult to read. Um, and I yeah. think it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm a lawyer. And reading the terms of use, it might as well be Sanskrit. Because you know, it goes on for page after page after page, and, and you have to literally sit and focus and go, oh, wait a minute, let me start over. What is that again? It is so indecipherable. Um, but there's also good information in there that, that tells you what you can and can't do and what your rights are and all that kind of thing, but you either have to have the patience and time to do it or you have to have a, a lawyer friend to, yeah. to figure it out. And I think in a lot of ways as an advocate, that's on me, right? Like I think there's a lot more that we can be doing um, to put out all of us, not just EFF, but um, mm. to be putting out more information that's really digestible for folks. Yeah. Um, I really do like the idea about an about section of this is how we use our algorithm. This is how your data is going to be used. I so like that idea. In the last six minutes, I want to get into like the what's going to happen next and the life cycle of the business model. And I'm going to turn it to Scott in a second. But I'm looking on my own phone. I have currently downloaded Blue Sky, Mastodon, Threads, Instagram, LinkedIn, Nextdoor, TikTok, Duolingo, YouTube, PayPal, all of which have social components to them. That is my current social network list on my phone. The number of times I open any of these in a given week, hard to say, not many for many of them. But there is a question like, where are we going next? And is this a natural part of the life cycle or is this an amalgamation that we're living through now? So I want to turn to Scott who okay. can, I think can open up that conversation. All right, so um, uh, she's turning it over to me. I think she doesn't want to say this word, but uh, Cory Doctorow wrote a piece, um, uh, an article in Wired, it's, it was written in Wired, and it, was appeared, it appeared in Wired, and it was called End Shittification. And because and that, that means that uh, um, social media platforms start off really great for the user mm -hmm. and then they become shittier over time so and it's because it's the business cycle at, at the at the beginning of the business cycle you're getting a lot of money from VCs you're getting a lot of money from and also interest rates used to be lower they used to be able to borrow a lot of money and so they, they, they're able to cater to the users uh, in really wonderful ways, and this is to, to bring in the users, to, to bring people in, and hopefully get them into the habit of using the uh, platform. And then over time, they need to bring in more advertising revenue and become self-supporting. So they start slipping in more ads, they start doing more things that, that make the um, site a little bit less pleasant to use, but are, are raising more money for them. So they, they you know, it's, it's, it's really the business cycle of having to 
you know, having a lot of money and in, investor money at, at the upfront, and then that tapers off, and eventually they have to start earning more money on their own. So they have to change things, uh, the way that thing, the, the way that things work. For instance, in Facebook, I, I talk about what what is the signal to noise ratio, where signal is hearing your, from your friends, hearing from your family talking with real people on groups and, and noises is advertisements and suggested readings and, and things like that, suggested for you and things like that. Uh, where, where obviously there's business, you know, the, they're trying to engage you from a business perspective, they're trying to sell you something, they're trying to influence what you buy, um, and that's what they're selling and, and that's the revenue side of the business. So um, that's, that's really part of kind of what I wanted to talk about here, although you went in other directions, this is fine. Um, I, said, I don't always think of everything, but that, this, this, that was the original uh, kind of thrust of this um, topic. So in the last three, I want to be like, where's the next wedding happening? Is it going to get worse with time? Um, and what should people like, where should we all meet up when we leave this this physical space that we have together, <laughs> and what is our expectation? Bring us home ninety seconds each. Okay, I mean, if you look at what's happening and the things that are becoming more popular and less popular, I think the the future is going to be something like TikTok, the because it's just had this spectacular growth, and I think the video component is going to be more important moving forward than the written word. A lot of people just don't read, so having that you know, Instagram, TikTok kind of thing of the immediate gratification of seeing something visual, that's where I think things will continue to go. I think you'll see consolidation. You'll have some, you know, some, someone will come up with something new and one of the big fish will, will snap it up. And so there will probably be more consolidation in the industry uh, under one larger tent, my prediction. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you. If past is prologue, right? If you yeah. think about, like, Instagram being bought by Facebook, I remember that was a huge story, and that was, you know, to kind of to Scott's point, like, okay, well, what's going to happen to this community that was really user-focused now that it's owned by this company that has to, you know, turn over, uh, like, monetization and, um, and, and uh, what am I trying to say, revenue and profit projections over to their board every quarter. Um, and I think, you know, to some extent we have seen, you know, those platforms change. I don't know where we're all going to meet. I mean, I think in many ways I do feel like I'm right back to where I was as a young reporter in 2010, right? Just kind of like looking at all of these, um, all these new companies that are coming up. And I think we're, we're just going to have to kind of see where the, where the market takes us. Um, you know, it, my naive hope, of course, is that some of them might some of the new things might learn from the lessons of the old ones. I don't know uh, how naive that really is, but that would be really fantastic. Yeah. Speaking of hope, uh, my hope is because studies show that you're much happier when you get out of the world of digital friends and actually hang out with your real friends, that people will see maybe living in the real world isn't such a bad thing and I should hang out with my real friends instead of notching more digital likes and digital friends and all of that, that in the grand scheme of things, you know, Spend time with friends and your family and your loved ones. That's my optimistic hope, whether that comes to pass. Yeah. My digital friends are my real friends. Yeah. Um, I am told that rebellions are built on hope, um, so I think hope is a good note <laughs> to walk away from this on. We could have done a panel on any of the issues you all brought up at the beginning of this and spoken for hours and hours at a time. Um, I hope we did a decent job at trying to walk that line of all of these different issues. And if you think we did, rate our panel on the Dragon Con app. And if you don't think we did, maybe just don't open the Dragon Con app for a little while. <laughs> but thank you all for coming thank and you. for being great and participatory and, and hearing what um, these two experts had to say and letting me talk a little bit. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And also, I have 11 EFF ribbons left. Please don't make me take